landscape hydration is the thing that we uh, want to do to maintain moisture in the landscape. And um, once we've achieved that, we want to do what Steve Lucas was talking about and to um, test the water, the runoff, and to make sure that we're not polluting the waterways, the wetlands and that sort of thing. I think it's been a, a good day and uh, I hope everyone's enjoyed it. I've done a little PowerPoint just to um, illustrate a few points. Barbara and I have been on this place for 20 years. We bought it in 99. Um, we did a lot of work in the first 10 years and uh, then the last five years probably has been a bit of a drag because of weather and health issues, but uh, we're hopefully that <clears throat> we'll get a bit of rain and uh, we can, uh, you know, strike out and have a few more uh, improvements. So we're talking about landscape hydration uh, in this and basically just making the point, water is the essential element for life. Without water, as you all know, it's obvious now, nothing happens, you know. And eventually, desertification, which took over, you know, the Fertile Crescent in the Fertile Crescent in um, Syria and these places, a thousand years ago, used to be the place where all the grain grew. Now it's desert, and desertification is going across very wide areas. Uh, and helped along by climate change. So there's, a, there's some references in this, but the landscape soil basically, when it's fertile, is a carbon sponge, and it's linked with carbon linkages with the minerals and the biology, and that's what functions to make plants grow. So the biological layer is only a couple of hundred millimetres deep, and if we can keep moisture in that couple of hundred millimetres, and regard that as a storage area, then we hydrate the landscape and we can get growth. The green plants act as insulation and cool the landscape. Anyone who's been down the beach on a hot day knows you walk across the beach, your feet get hot, where do you head for? The bloody grass. Because it's cool. And it's as simple as that. Soils, bare soils, these, these paddocks that the cotton growers have that are bare with no water and they're just brown soils, they're pushing out 60 degrees above those on a hot day. If they had a good crop of cotton on it, it would only be 20, 25 degrees because the plants respire and cool the atmosphere. Right, so there's an old Chinese general from the 12th century who said, in times of peace, prepare for war. In times of war, prepare for peace. If you paraphrase that, in times of drought, prepare for the flood. Now, we should be preparing today to conserve whatever water we get in our landscape, in our streams, regulate our streams so they flow for longer periods and we don't have a big wooshka and send it all down to the sea. You know, we need that water and we need to keep it. So it's going to rain sometime and we need to do what we need to do to, to conserve it. That's the point. These are the free things we get on every piece of land. Nature is the management system. It works despite our best efforts to kill it, poison it and be better and smarter than it. Gravity brings things from up to down, right? So any water you put up here will come down there, free. Sunshine, energy coming in 300 watts per square metre every day. Water, purified by evaporation, free, delivered to you through the air. Carbon dioxide, the same deal. You, you breathe it out, it comes back, the plants take it up, it's all done free through the air. And soil is the place where it all begins. The soil is not sand and ground up rocks. It's biology that's fixing carbon, getting carbon from the photosynthesizing plants and fixing it in the, in the ground 
to lock up minerals and make them plant available. It's a complex thing. It's only recently being understood, like in the last 10 years. And that is the thing that works for us. Not the rocks, not the gravel, that sort of thing. It's the biology in the soil which fixes carbon, makes complex compounds, binds uh, minerals and water and makes that available plant. It's a big exchange system. The landscape, well, it's what it is and uh, it's various forms and mountains and hills and rivers and lakes and all that stuff. Uh, you don't need me to tell you much about that. You only have to look out the window. This is our landscape. This is our property here. This is our neighbour Stuart's property. And this is showing the wetlands, the river frontage. This is a high piece of ground that's got normal trees growing on it. And we have here 44 metres at the top of that hill above that water. And that's the fall through. That's the gravity we use. And that big dam has got a catchment of about those two creeks, actually. This one and this one have got a catchment of about 500 hectares. You can look out there and get an idea of it. Now, we put that dam in there in the first place because the water had stripped down through there and that valley, that gully, was just a black salt scar when we came here. So it's good for nothing. So we put a big dam across there. We'll see it later on. Back that water up, and now it's a perch wetland, a call it what you like, but it's a reservoir for water and wildlife and all sorts of things. The other thing that it does, it slows up the rush of water which goes down those creeks through those wetlands and into the river. Now, our problem at the moment is, and, and it has been for some time, is that our rainfalls are heavy and then prolong dry periods. This wetlands, which is a functional area for water purification and feeding fish and all sorts of things, is not functioning because it's dried out. It's got to be kept wet so it works like a wetland. So hydration, we've got to think about water in the landscape, soil moisture, subsoil moisture, plants and biology. Plants are water storage. They're 80% water, these green plants. The more green plants you've got, the more water you've got. The more roots and things that are in the ground and bugs, the more water you've got. The worms are 80% water. We're 80% water. And that's a critical thing to get. In your head, water on the landscape, streams, rivers, lakes, dams, swamps, wetlands, ocean. The faster it goes down, rattles down that, the less you get a chance to use it. So water conservation in the landscape is very important. So water management, we've got rain, we've got infiltration, we've got runoff, evaporation, groundwater and subsurface aquifers. Now, we've got a problem with rain, everyone knows that. Infiltration, hopeless at the moment. We get a downpour on this ground here, it's straight off. And not only is it straight off, it takes the surface layer and all the organic detritus, things there, down into the river. So we've got to slow it up. Uh, evaporation, well, that's a function of plants and things. And evaporation is very important. Evaporation of a dam is not much good because it's just going up in the air, but it does cool the atmosphere. Evaporation from plants or transpiration means that the area above the plants is about 25 to 30 degrees, high humidity. Bare earth, temperatures up 60 degrees, dry, heat straight up into the atmosphere. No return. Nighttime, what do you get? Nothing. Nighttime in a humid atmosphere, you get dew. You know, it's a recycle. It's a, what they call a small water cycle. So here's a, a thing, there's a guy called Michael Kravich who I'll talk about later on, but he did a, he's a hydrologist in Czechoslovakia and he's developed 
a whole bunch of things and I'll come to later on. But he talks about the small water cycle. Now, we've got the large water cycle, which is the stuff coming from the Indian Ocean or cyclones coming in from, you know, the Pacific and making big things. But they don't happen all that often. The small water cycle is a functionality of rain, evaporation, and these little cycles which are going on all the time. That's what we're missing. We're missing those little showers to keep our landscape hydrated. Why are we missing them? Because we're not getting the evaporation, we haven't got the green plants, and the cycle's been cut. This is what we're planning to do here. We put in an application to LLS to do a number of things. Fence off these riparian areas to keep the cattle out and keep the streams um, with good plants growing and that sort of thing. Then from here, we're planning to put a fairly large solar pump, not a, that big, you know, 10 cubic metres an hour, in there and pump water from here up to that turkey's nest dam, which is 30 metres above the ground. And that pressurises that pipe all the way through there. All that red line is pressurised to 30 metres. Now, some people want to put tanks in high level, but we just dug a dam up there. It's a bit of a leaky dam, and you'll see up there, when you go up there, you'll see some of the walls are green. Why? Because the water's leaking through, and the grass can stay green. So it's water going through the soil, which is what we need. We've got to concentrate on. What we're trying to do here is to provide off-stream watering for our cattle. We run, under normal conditions, 90 paddocks on that, 90 one-day paddocks. In regenerative farming, the cattle don't get back onto the same paddock for 90 days. They're in there for a day. It's good grass. You'll see it later. Eat, shit, stomp it down, move. That gives a chance then for everything to grow, to to drop seeds, to put down deep roots, and that sort of thing. If you keep your grass this tall, your roots are only going to be that tall. If you keep your grass this tall, you're going to have roots a metre and a half down. And those roots in the ground, when that grass gets eaten off, they die. They provide organic material and bugs for the ground. And then the next cycle comes and you're slowly pumping carbon and biology into the soil. So that's the plan for that's the first stage we're talking about. All that piping plus that fencing. And with a bit of luck, the LLS will get off their backside shortly. They've been promising approval for about three weeks. But they got a good excuse for the bushfires, which is fair enough. But we still like get approval and get on with it. So Newton, old guy, pretty wise said, if I've seen further, it's by standing upon the shoulders of giants. Well, I found some giants for you, and I'm, I've got a document here that um, Joe will make available to be emailed out to people with references from these giants and presentations on YouTube which spell out the functionality of climate, soil, all that sort of thing, far better than I can do it. These are the guys. P.A. Yeomans, mining engineer in the 40s, and he developed key line systems. He had a property at Richmond down south of Sydney, and uh, he worked out key line where, the, where the, the steep slopes changed to less steep. That's his key line point. That's where he used to put his dams. He used to run swales from... Uh, one side to the other, and uh, I've got a couple of pictures of his stuff here somewhere, which I'll, I'll make them available later on anyway. But he linked all these dams together, and then he developed a plough, which he used to plough on the contours slightly downwards towards the ridge, and then when he dropped water out of his dams via the swales, it would go into these key line cuts and it would move from the lower... Instead of going down the creek, it would go across to the ridge. And what that meant was that gravity 
would evenly put that water across and he had developed very good pastures. Ah, shit. Peter, uh, Bill Mollison, permaculture. Brilliant guy, dead now. But, you know, a whole bunch of stuff that you can look up, Bill Mollison, and all the little tricks that you can do about water and chooks and pigs and all that sort of stuff, mind-blowing in a, in a small area. Not a big, you know, multiple acres, but, you know, an acre can feed a family of four, no problem. And he's shown all that. Peter Andrews, rel relatively modern guy, came out with natural sequence farming up in the Bylong Valley, big hills, flat valley, creek down the middle. Creek was running dry. He bought the joint, put dams and willow trees and all these things, you know, big fight with the authorities about the bloody willow trees. But he blocked the river and put weirs across it and this place was hydrated and it grew. And not only that, the creek became permanent. So the people down the creek who was whinging about him blocking it found that they had a permanent creek because it, all the water that rained on the place didn't go off in five minutes. It stayed there, you know, a bit longer and worked its way through the landscape. Walter Jenny, Jenner, CSIRO scientist, Brilliant guy, doing a lot of work at the moment on soil, the carbon sponge. And he's treating soil and how it works and how plants work. It's not something that I can tell you in five minutes, but it is really worth looking up on YouTube. His whole presentations are there. You can sit there for an hour and watch the whole thing, and it's really educational. The same for all of these. That's all of these guys have got YouTube presentations or old news. You know, in the in the 40s, they got old um, movie tone news pictures of um, Yeomans and his plough. And he got 5,000 people at field days on his property. 5,000 people. And there's pictures of them. That's unbelievable. Ah. Michael Kravitz, he's a Czechoslovakian guy, a Slovak guy, and he's on the small water cycle. He had a situation after the, um, after the uh, Velvet Revolution uh, in, in Czechoslovakia when the Russians got kicked out and the people took over again. They were going to build a big dam and flood a small historical village. And there's a big protest against it. And he made a proposal to the president not to build that dam, but to get him a couple of hundred, a uh, couple of hundred million uh, euros to build that dam. He made a proposal to the president, and he got 25 million euros to build 100,000 small dams up in the hills, blocking creeks off, temporary blocking wood things, beaver dams, this sort of stuff. To hold the moisture, to hold the water back, he employed eight thousand out of work people to do it. And what happened was that the lowlands in Slovakia, which were drying out and desertifying, and the mountains, which were getting a lot of rain, the small water cycle returned, and the lowlands got the moisture and became more fertile again. And it's example. He's done a presentation for the east coast of Australia for the same thing, for small scale dams right along the Great Dividing Range to bring the small water cycle back into the west of the range and those west flowing rivers are the ones that fill up the Murray-Darling Basin and that's what's going wrong. You know, if you don't have rain, you can whistle. You can do all the millions, billions of dollars in the Murray, but, you know, it's just going to be a desert. Charles Massey, a brilliant book. Uh, the Song of the Reed Warbler, who goes over uh, dozens and dozens of examples of farmers who have just either been burnt out or lost, lost, done their shirt, who have gone back to regenerative farming, minimal inputs, maximum landscape hydration, a beautiful book to read. Alan Savory is the father of holistic farming. He was a guy in... Um, Zimbabwe, who was a, a ranger, 
They killed 50% of the elephants in his park because they reckon they were knocking down the trees and buggering it up. The park didn't improve. So he figured out that it wasn't the animals that were causing the trouble. It was the fact that they couldn't move through their natural cycle. So the wildebeest and that sort of thing, which used to go through an area, eat it out and not come back there for at least a quarter or so, gave the stuff a chance to grow. The nature, the animals, are not the cause of the problem. The people and the management and the crappy management and the greed is the cause of the problems. Christine Jones, amazing carbon, soil scientist, just tells you everything you want to know about how the plants, green plants and bugs in the soil work to make soil. Very, very interesting. So this little rat run down about how many organisms and things are in a handful of soil. More organisms and a handful of soil than all the people on Earth. Weight of organisms in the surface, 10 centimetres of cropping soil in, in southern Australia can be as much as two tonnes per hectare. Now, how many cattle do you run per hectare on the top? Not many. Four, maybe, if you're really good. One, to the, one beast to the acre. If you're really good, beast's only 500 kilos. Under the ground, working for you, is a couple of tonne of bugs. Okay, the organisms are located up the surface. You dry the surface out, you put the brakes on them. Uh, and a lot of them are just relaxing. So, you know, that's just as a reference to all that stuff from soilquality.org. Same thing here in water infiltration. They run the water infiltration, they run the mineral density, and they run the nutrient cycles. Christine Jones has got a good piece on the lack of minerals in our food dropping down, dropping down all the time, and it's a function of the lack of bugs in the soil and lack of chelation of minerals in the soil. These, this um, carbon sponge bi biology sequesters the minerals and holds them there and plant available. So there's plenty of minerals to nourish the plants. If there's no bugs, no minerals, you know, you can put as many, much fertiliser on you like, it doesn't work. This is this property in the good old days when it rained. This is regenerative agriculture where you strip grazing a dense mob of cattle and you're leaving a fair bit of stuff so that it can regrow. Now that stuff gets left there for 90 days. Sometimes if there's a lot of uneaten crap in there, like that verbena plant there maybe, I would run over that with a mulcher, dragging a chain to spread the shit, and then let it grow. And it grows back and it puts, makes seeds and puts deep roots there, and the whole thing's functional. It's not like a green on a golf course that long and that much roots. So there we are. The neighbour's place over here, you can see it now. He, he, he mulched all his bloody tea tree crop the other day. Never does anything with it. Grows tea tree, mulches it down, whinges about everything. <laughs> this, this grass here, you can see vetch in there. It's multi-species. That's rye. Rye grass we couldn't get to grow here. For five years I tried to put rye grass seed out and grow. Never, it wouldn't bloody grow. Kaikia would grow in the summer, you know, a bit of rain, kaikia would grow. Now, not now, but previously, we would feed more cattle now in the winter with this system than in the summer because of the ability for rye and stuff like that to grow. Now, we couldn't get it to grow. The secret was... So I made up a concoction with molasses, some mycorrhizal fungi, some trace minerals, boron, carbon, uh, uh, copper, etc., etc. This little recipe. Took a litre of that stuff, half a bag of rye seed in the bloody concrete mixer, coated it, threw a couple of handfuls of bloody dry lime in there to, to seal it. The, rye, the, the seed sucks the moisture up and then you just spin it out and you've got inoculated seed. It's got the mycorrhizal fungi, the bugs that work in the roots. If they're not there, the stuff won't grow. It's as simple as that. So 
So there you are. You can see that, again, regenerative farming there with strips of graze moving slowly with electric fences. That's later. You can see the uh, ryegrass. That's, that's the hill that's up there. And you'll see a picture of that now as it is in a minute. Again, cattle in ryegrass. That's here. We have nothing here when we first came here. Clay, bloody carpet grass and whiskey grass and bugger all else. You can see again the grey strip and the ungrey strip. That's what happens when you had a bit of rain. The cattle will trample and shit that in. You couldn't get a better base for that to start growing again. You just got to add a bit of water and a bit of time. Same again. Some grasses they haven't eaten. This is more giant paspalum by the looks of it. They're a bit iffy about that when they start to get well fed. That's in giant paspalum there, and it gets big, as you can see. That is flat. Very interesting stuff, this. Um, broadleaf paspalum grows under trees and in areas that things don't want to grow. Native grass. Cattle aren't, don't find it that palatable. I'll tell you, they eat it now. They don't want much else. They're down there, down by the river eating it. Story again. Typical things. That's down by our river flats. No fertiliser, no nothing, just inoculated seed. That's ryegrass. That's what happens when all our soil gets sealated down the river. That was our crossing, causeway, the rocks, the big con one tonne concrete blocks. All right, no problem. You, you only have to try it. <laughs> now I tie it to trees. I tie it to trees, right? The only trees I can't tie it to are bloody angophoras and, and a couple of others that have got a sappy bark because it shorts it out. But anything with a dry bark, like iron barks and bloody paper barks, no problem. Kazer yep, no problem. No. <sighs> It, it, it might, you know, click a little bit, but, you know, it doesn't matter. The cattle, once, once you've got electric fence working, the cattle give up testing it. You know, they know what's going on. You leave it off for a month, they know, they'll bloody walk through it. But you have it on, they'll go down. What they do is they put their whiskers on it. They'll go and put their whiskers on it. As soon as they get a tingle, they say, oh. That's today. That's the picture. That's that's that. Today. That's our high level Eagles Nest Dam today. Pure water, clean. That's about three hundred thousand litres, give or take. And what that's that's the dam I'm gonna pump up into. Up here, it's 30 metres above stuff, and that sets the whole pressure in the system. So what, what's happening in that dam compared to a tank, right? People say, oh, put a tank up a hill. A tank's nothing. A tank's money, and you get nothing for it. This dam, it's about a, half a day to dig that dam with an excavator. And this dam was a challenge because this is up in the rocks, and this is a leaky dam. When we first built that dam, it wouldn't hold water for a while. So what did we do? We got some pigs. We put the pigs in there and fed the pigs in there, and they stomped around in the bottom of the dam and brought the mud up and sealed the dam. It still leaks as, it, as the level gets up, but that's the way to fix it, using nature. Now, what we're doing here, nature is purifying that water. That water's crystal clear. You'll see that later on. You've got snakes, all sorts of bloody frogs and stuff living in there. Why would you have a bloody tank when you can have all that? We built dams cascading down to try and conserve water, which we do. We've got water on this property. There's no problem about getting drink water for the cattle to drink. Problem is there's no water in the bloody ground. At the edge of this dam, you can see the green patch, right? That's 
a slow leak through the wall of that dam. So that's landscape hydration. But we've got to extend it. Now, once we pump the water up to the top here, we can then run it in contours down, cascade it back down. It ends up in the big dam down here, where the pump is, and it can be brought back up again. What, for free? Sun. No going out and getting petrol. No changing bloody spark plugs or pulling down carburetors or all that crap. It just works every day for free. I got a grant from the New South Wales government to develop a solar pump. I've had it in my swimming pool down below. It's run for the last 18 months, every day, non-stop, no touch except clean the screen. No petrol, no maintenance. It's a pool pump, a plastic pool pump. But there, what I'm going to do in this down here, I can get a four-inch submersible pump, stick it out in the dam on a float, run the power cable ashore, put a, some, half a dozen solar panels northeast facing, and that'll pump every day. And it does 60 metres head, 20 cubic metres an hour. At 60 metres. So that's the problem. Just add water and keep it there. So we've got climate change effects, greater cyclones, greater droughts, hotter temperatures to bake the soil, changes in the average rainfall in certain areas, faster runoff, less infiltration, water loss to the rivers and oceans, loss of topsoil, loss of soil biology. We're heading for a desert. It's as simple as that. So detention systems is what I'm hot on about. Leaky dams blocking the streams in the high country so that it slows the flow of water down. It doesn't take it out, it just slows it down. Key line dams to retain water for redistribution. Swales to detain and redirect water from the dams. Long contour overflows to reduce water velocity and concentration to slow the water down. Well, we've got a classic example of that on the overflow of the big dam. I had five goes at fixing that overflow because that, when that dam fills, it comes down like buggery. So I had to put an overflow, which is about 500 metres long, around the contour. What I did was I dug with big excavator I've got, two metres by two metres in the overflow, and the downhill side was cut on the contour, and all the spoil was thrown on the uphill side with a few gaps in it for the water to get through. Now, what happens is that when, when the overflow works, it goes over that edge about that deep, and it goes right along the landscape and filters into the ground. Where I had bare clay and um, scleretal forest or whatever you call it, there with bare clay and shitty carpet grass and a few things. Now, it's chock-a-block under those trees with broadleaf paspala. Self-seeded, just there because the water's there. Key line ploughing on the contours, solar pumps to transfer water to the ridges, solar pumps to lift water to higher level dams, solar pumps to transfer water to troughs for off-stream watering. All for free. Soil biology. The soil biology is there in a number of forms, but the the detritus sits on the top, that's feed for the worms and the other small animals and things and breaks down. The roots of the plants are exuding about 40 to 50% of the sugars made by the photosynthesis in the green plants and that feeds the bugs. And those bugs and fungi then go out and they build structures and they, the, the fungi go out and they exude organic acids. Those organic acids will dissolve minerals and sequester them so that they're not, then they can come back in the, in the fluid of the bloody bugs and be exchanged to the plant roots for sugars. There's a deal going on under the ground all the time and it's only from the sunshine and the green plants. So when we get then the glomalin, which is a 100-year half-life sticky stuff that holds the soil together, 
humic and fulvic acids, which stabilize minerals and that sort of thing. That's how it all works. So organic carbon attracts cations from the from salts, so it holds minerals in the plant for the plant so they don't leach out. Organic carbon prevents leaching, holds high levels of water in the soil so that, that it won't. It's the water is sequestered in these carbon matrices and it doesn't evaporate. It's available for the plants to use. Organic carbon reduces evaporation, plant available, etc. So basically, all energy comes from the sun. In the green plants, energy is converted to sugars. Plants provide energy as sugars to the subsoil biology. Subsoil biology produces the organic acids to dissolve the minerals. Organic acids sequester the minerals. Organic mineral salts have a pH between 7 and 8. And the, the biology in the soil adjusts the soil pH from acidic to about 6.5 to 7 or from alkaline 8 down to 6.5 and 7. There's not enough lime in the world to neutralise acidic soils. Yet... The basic chemistry guys, oh yeah, here's an acid, add lime, that'll neutralize it. It's just not possible. So our projects, stage one, this is what we've got a grant in for now. We want to exclude cattle from the wetlands, fence to exclude cattle from the dams, provide solar pumps to transfer water from the low level big dam to the higher level service dams, pipe work to enable the water troughs and 50 water points off stream watering. For reg and regenerative grazing, documentation and to s report the results. And that's what uh, we'll be talking about after morning tea. And maintain fences and water trough systems. Stage two, independent testing of the water and dams, which Steve's going to do based on the uh, expert work from the uh, Uni of uh, Newcastle. Develop simple soil testing procedures for on-farm soil monitoring for moisture, infiltration and carbon content. Set up test plots on the ridges alongside the water transfer lines to trial landscape hydration, soil carbon enhancement plots incorporating perennial pastures and pasture cropping. Hydration trials using trickle water distribution on the ridges. Why on the ridges? Because the ridges then let it trickle down under gravity. Develop larger scale trickle water transfers, monitor infiltration rates, various sorts, monitor water flows in the stream so we know that, you know, we're not pinching all the water that's going through the nature. All we're trying to do is keep the reservoir, which is bone dry at the moment, the soil, top so it's fu fully functional, and then let the balance go as the streams and the rivers do. So document the results and report. Stage three, expand the trickles, diverse seeding, slowly expand the plant area, submit a proposal for New South Wales water to allow us to put more detention dams in the streams to slow the off run up, runoff up, diverse seeding on the ridges, monitor the soil, etc., etc. And that's it. Thank you very much.